Okay, so we talked about what social psychologists study, and we talked a little bit about how social psychologists study that. Um, I think if you look into most introductory chapters of textbooks, the next section is either downplayed or missing a little bit, but it's really, really important. I think if we think about the problems social psychology face, if you look in the textbook that I recommend for you to read, it's all about the ethical problems associated with some of the methods of social psychology. For instance, social psychologists like to use deception. They like to lie to uh, participants. They also do sometimes very extreme versions of experiments. But we will talk about this when we talk about these famous experiments, such as the Stanford Prison Experiment or the Milgram Conformity Studies. And we will talk about how this is ethically problematic. One thing I think that if you lived on the rock for the last five years as a social psychologist or psychologist in general, then you might not have heard of it. But social psychology and psychology in general and social psychology in particular was really hit hard by the replication crisis. You learned about this last year, but I think it's very important to be reminded that a lot of that is particularly pronounced in social psychology. And I will talk a little bit about this and the problems now using three case studies of three men. Um, but we will have to talk about this over and over again because some of the most famous experiments in social psychology do not what psychologists call replicate. So if you do them again, they do not work. There are many, many reasons for that. I think, as you can see in a slide beforehand, I say it's the best of times, it's the worst of times. I think social psychology was never as influential as it was. And social psychology is at the forefront and trying to change psychology and even changing science and trying to get to increase our rates of replication. But this is steered because we were basically on many levels and are uh, the worst offenders of some of the malpractices of science. And I will start by talking about these three men, Daryl Bam, John Barch, and Dietrich Stapel. Let's start with Stapel. He's somewhat the easiest case. Um, he is a social psychologist who was convicted of having 58 retractions. He was convicted of fraud. He cheated. He made up his own data. At some point, he would say he would just sit at his computer on his own and type in the numbers into SPSS. And some of his PhD students or postdocs, I can't remember, discovered that basically they always had the same data. And he would say later, the way he was caught is that he was too lazy to recreate a new data set and type in the numbers. So he just used um, studies or old data from old studies. You can see here, this is from Retraction uh, Watch. There's like 58 articles with many, many studies um, were retracted. And this is like one part of science in general that is problematic, one part of social psychology, that people cheat, that they make up data. There's so much pressure on, on people like me, on researchers in order to uh, pr find kind of spectacular findings, um, findings that grab the imagination of the public. And that is how you make your name. And that puts a lot of incentives on cheating not only in social psychology, but social psychology has some very high caliber cases. And Dietrich Snapple, a very influential social psychologist, um, had 58. Um, you can see here, this is Retraction Watch Leaderboard. This is a scientific site that kind of tracks who and where things get retracted. That is basically if something has been found to be wrong with the data. Medicine is traditionally the worst uh, offender of that. There's the most pressure. You can see see anesthesiology, anesthesiology, bone research and bone research. You can see the person um, who's leading the field with the most um, fraud, with the most uh, cheating in articles is a bone researcher with 180. 83rd, uh, 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 183 cases. But you can see Dietrich Stapel has a good place in the top five. There's very little you can do other than double checking and tracking. And we talk a little bit about this at the end about if somebody is willing to outrightly make up and fake data, it's very hard to spot. And so this is something we have to keep in mind that some of the results are part, some, especially one famous um, uh, experiment, the Stanford Prison Experiment, is very much part of being a fraud and other famous experiments as well. So keep that in mind when we go through that. 
The other one is like, which basically is much more serious in some ways about the scientific method is the replication crisis in psychology. You talked with James Yearsley about that last year, but now we want to uh, kind of uh, uh, talk a little bit about the role that social psychology had. You see here John Barch when I was a, a PhD at New York University, a PhD candidate when I was saying he was the star in social psychology. He was like, uh, uh, he was uh, slightly full of himself, I would say. Um, but he was the person uh, everyone looked up to. He did a lot of what's called unconscious priming. We will come back to that. Um, but he became famous for that. And he basically kind of started this revolution. His studies in the late 90s were became super famous. And then everyone in the 2000s, probably till 2010, till the replication crisis really hit hard. Uh, everybody wanted to do unconscious priming. We can prime this and that, okay? And here you can see John Barr's work on unconscious process with unobstrufous priming tasks is at the center of the replication crisis in psychology. Um, his... Uh, um, uh, kind of work. Uh, so, okay. Um, the way that kind of unfolded with uh, John Barsh is the following. I think he had a study, a very famous study, where we primed people with the concept of being old. So not with explicitly saying old, but they had to do word puzzles. And the word puzzles were about um, uh, Florida, about forgetfulness, about any other way uh, or words that Americans associate with being old. And so the idea was that by doing these word puzzles would unconsciously would be activated is the concept of old and then he stopped the time it took them at new york university to walk from the experimental room to the elevator and he said that if you prime people with the concept of old then they walk slower than if you prime people with something unrelated and it became a very famous study which kind of the idea that you can prime concepts without attention about uh, without conscious awareness and people then shape their behavior alongside so then somebody tried to replicate it and they couldn't and they failed and has become uh, they published it and then john barge kind of lost it a little bit and attacked them and said oh my god this is not the fault of the study it's just like some incompetent researchers look at them they don't even know how to do a study and their results are published in this low impact journal not where i publish and so this was not a very gracious way of uh, going about it a lot of people distance distings uh, distance um, them, uh, from him and also it's kind of it's the wrong approach if somebody tries to replicate my stuff I get uh, often requests um, uh, just like last week I'm part of like my one of my studies was picked in a huge replication project uh, to be replicated and they ask me for the materials and they ask me for my help and obviously I uh, 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 provided that but the way it's like if my study does not replicate then I think like okay what are the scientific merits of the replication why why doesn't it was that study better done than my study and if so then it might be my fault or it might be the study the initial thought i might have made a mistake not attack the person who tries to replicate that okay um, so this is basically what happened. He had another study, which we come back when we talk about impressions people make in, I think, in the third uh, part of our lectures, where they basically uh, did the following. You either were uh, told to hold a hot cup or a cold cup. And the idea is that of at the center of our impressions we form about other people is whether you're warm or a cold person. So if I hold something warm and then have to judge another person, I will judge you more favorably. I will like you more than if I hold something cold. At some point, he even suggested and had a study where they showed basically that if you shower a lot really hot, that means that you're kind of lonely. You're trying to overcompensate for your loneliness. And he would go so far to say in some articles that instead of taking antidepressants, you just have to drink a warm um, uh, soup. You just have to take or maybe just eat a warm soup super warm soup whatever you do with a soup you eat the warm soup and this will make you so warm this has the same effect as antidepressants so he was really over the top but some of these studies just didn't replicate okay um so this was the original finding holding a warm cup of coffee can make you feel socially closer to those around you um 
it's like a just right here. Um, holding a warm cup is a therapeutic pad. We're more likely to choose a gift for a friend instead for themselves. So to become more social, if you hold a warm pad, um, you have the sense of warm makes people more giving. Um, and uh, so, um, and they kind of tried to replicate it, but couldn't replicate it. So there are many more other studies of John Bach, but also at large where people did priming studies, did kind of studies, and they did not replicate. So the replication rate of studies is somewhat lower in social psychology than in other fields of psychology. Okay. Um, so this is really, really important. Okay. Um, I just want to kind of put that in context. Um, I think here I have, so I think the, uh, reproducibility uh, index the kind of uh, likelihood that a study reproduces in social psychology is about 30 to 50 percent 30 to 50 percent okay so if 100 studies uh, that show one thing and i rerun the whole 100 other the same studies 30 to 50 will find the same results not super impressive not really good not cool okay in cancer research is even worse if you run a hundred study if you have cancer they will treat you based on studies. If you have 100 studies in cancer research and you redo them, 10 of them will find the same result. Only 10% replication rate. In water resource management, whatever that is, <laughs> studies are only estimated to be replicated but 0.6 to 6.8%. So 100 studies, only one would replicate. So. All I wanted to say is that this is not only specific to social psychology, but it's a problem all over science. There are many, many in, in incentives to cut corners, to have, um, uh, to not do uh, uh, um, reproductions and so forth. So it's a real big problem, especially in social psychology. You will see, especially in the second part, that a lot of the key assumptions we were holding about um, the human nature do not hold up when we take into account the failure to replicate some of these studies. Now, here's the weirder thing. And this is uh, 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 Daryl Bam. And he did an Irish at NYU at that time. And I remember we had large discussions about it. Uh, he did a study about ESP. And ESP, uh, I hope I kind of wrote that down somewhere I didn't. because So he thought that basically you and I, what we can do, we can have, um, oh, no, I can't remember what the ESP is. Oh, come, let me just have a look. Extrasensory perception. Thank you, Past Andreas, for that. So he thought that basically you can anticipate the future. You can now have a feeling, an intuition about what will happen in the future, okay? And I think the crazy thing about this, like he did studies about this. He get, I think he published this in Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, our flagship journal. Think of it of the second chapter we had today. This is the most important journal. And what we, he finds basically in these studies that people actually can have this extra perceptual sense of um uh, of anticipating the future. He finds with our standard methods uh, approved by this method, by kind of like the, uh, the most important journal that people can see into the future. Obviously, this breaks all kinds of physics and laws and is absolutely impossible, but it shows us, and this is the most troubling, I think this is by far the most troubling thing, that often even if we use the most stringent approaches, we might find something that is not true. Right here, um, I think uh, uh, one uh, researcher has quoted, if this paper were true, our understanding of the entire world, the universe, physics and psychology for sure would be completely different, right? Uh, extra uh, uh, sensory perception, also called ESP, is when you can perceive things that are not immediately available in space or time, Bam said. So for example, when you perceive something on the other side of the world, on a different room or something that has not happened yet. Here's one of the studies they did. Um, so basically you would see two kind of um, uh, uh, things. Uh, you would, uh, things is not really good. It's like here I took uh, red curtains and you have to predict where a picture would appear. Okay. So you would have to say, oh, it will a picture appear on the left or on the right? And what you can see is basically here is a picture on the right. What they find in these studies is that if there were kind of, I think, male pornographic pictures, people had a better than chance prediction rate. 
Okay, so if you have half naked or naked men, you're able to predict whether they will appear randomly on the left or the right side. The key thing is that the mechanism um, uh, uh, for selecting the picture only was activated after you put in your prediction. So you would say left and then the computer would randomize it and then it would put in there. Um, so I think there's here I have a, a picture of James Yearsley. You sh uh, you talked about this in uh, the last year. It's really important to kind of think about it. What most people think what BEM did, and um, when you kind of try to replicate its studies, it doesn't work that well as you might expect, right? Um, but what he, what most people of us think is that he did um, some p hacking, right? That he kind of like, oh, I have five different types of pictures, and by chance I find that the male pornographic pictures worked okay that's what i predict now and that's what's called p hacking right and other questionable research practices you had that with james seriously i don't want to um uh, uh kind of um go back to that one thing i want to say and that's kind of like i think the beacon of light here is that yes social psychology is guilty of a lot of dirty techniques social psychology is full or um is not full, but is uh, capable of fraud. And there are some really important fraud cases that we come to. Yes, replication is somewhat lower than in other fields of psychology. And yes, we like to use, or we liked to use a lot of um, questionable uh, 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 question, uh, um, research practice. But our field is also now at the forefront of trying to change that. Many, many initiatives uh, that are pushed in order to improve Proof uh, psychological signs are pushed by social psychologists. So here's a random paper that I picked to kind of show you that. Here is in uh, psychological science, maybe the most important psychological journal at the moment. Um, here's the name of the author. I can't really quite read it. And here you can see that there are attempts to improve the replica uh, replicable replicability of the papers of our studies and also the transparency so you can see in my paper i have open data you can look at my data i have all materials and i pre-registered my study i said before the study time stand before i run the study what i think will happen and how i will analyze the data in order to restrict the use of uh, questionable pra um, research practices so I think it's important to remember that social psychology has a problem, a replication problem, but it's also something that uh, we're actively trying to work, okay? Here are three important examples that kind of hit psychology very hard, social psychology in, in particular. Examples, I think, if you, I'm not mistaken, if you had psychology in your A-levels, you might have learned about them as if they were true. Okay, Stanford Prison example, most of it is a fraud. It's made up data, heavily manipulated. By Stanley fact, we would talk about this, Milgram. Okay, it's all, all of these don't hold up as well as you would think. So in the second part, when we talk about these types of effects, we have to come back to the replication crisis and kind of see how this change the way we see psychology.